Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk, e-cigarettes, a gateway to smoking or a good cessation method. It's not FDA approved, but it definitely works. I know everybody in my house has quit smoking because of it. Ahead inside the debate, are Indiana leaders overstepping their authority to yeah, regulate yeah, e-cigs, similarly to traditional tobacco products? A protected species is becoming a menace. They've done well for themselves, but they're causing they're causing me enough damage, I've got to do something. A proposal that's on the table addresses landowners' concerns, but others worry it will cause otters to disappear from the state again. Plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Ran, and welcome to Indiana News Desk. As the popularity of electronic cigarettes grows, Indiana politicians are pushing for tougher regulations at the state level. Legislators will consider a bill this session that aims to curb teen use of the products. Reporter Barbara Harrington joins us in the studio with more. Barbara, this proposal comes shortly after a national survey saying that electronic cigarette use is rising sharply among teens. Well, that's right, Joe. A University of Michigan monitoring the future study found that for the first time ever, more teens used electronic cigarettes in 2014 than any tobacco products. That alarming statistic has Indiana's Attorney General calling for change. But some say his proposal is premature and goes too far. Ooh. That's good. Justin Meyer spends a lot of his time in this smoke-filled shop in downtown Bloomington, and he's never felt better. I can breathe easier. Uh, I notice my circulation's better. I play a lot of music and my hands don't cramp up a lot. Meyer says those dramatic changes came after he switched from smoking traditional cigarettes to electronic cigarettes. I averaged about a pack a day. And then when I started vaping, I'd go through a 15 mil bottle a week. The e-cigarettes don't contain tobacco, but they do contain nicotine. It comes in liquid form, which is inserted into the e-cigarette and then converted to vapor when it's inhaled. Do you like those other seven flavors? The staff at Indy e -Cig says nearly all of their customers turn to vaping in an effort to quit smoking. They see it as a healthier alternative, similar to nicotine patches or gum that people use to kick the habit. We know the negative health effects of smoking. That's something we know. There's no question about it. The studies have been out forever. Um, so why, it's like, why continue to do something we know that's harmful um, when I have an alternative? But Indiana Attorney General Greg Zeller says there are no facts to back up those claims. The vape oil salesmen are telling people it's healthy for you. It's not as bad as cigarettes and it can help you beat your cigarette habit. None of those things uh, are really legal to say because they haven't been proven. The Federal Drug Administration only regulates e-cigarettes that are marketed for therapeutic purposes. That doesn't include the products sold at most Indiana vape shops, although the FDA has issued a proposed rule that would extend their authority to cover those products. And the FDA is still determining the health effects of e-cigarettes. The agency did a lab analysis of e-cigs from two major brands in 2009, and they found detectable levels of carcinogens and toxic chemicals. One of the cartridges contained a small amount of an ingredient used in antifreeze. The test also found that the cartridges contained different nicotine levels than what was indicated on the labels. Zeller says the country can't wait any longer for the FDA to step in to put the e-cigarette industry in check. 
So he's proposing regulations at the state level. It's already illegal to sell e-cigarettes to minors, but enforcement is an issue. That's why Zeller wants to require all stores that sell the products to be licensed. That would give the Alcohol Tobacco Commission the authority to send in essentially the excise police to go and check uh, the same way they do at liquor stores. The folks at Don's Vapor and Broad Ripple check people's IDs every time they come into the store. And requiring licensing, that's a measure they support. I respect that because, I mean, if you have a license of business, you know, that just kind of, I think it gives you more credibility as well. I mean, it means you're a little more professional about it anyway. And I think the license kind of keeps in hand what enforcement needs to be taken. Zeller also wants legislators to consider taxing electronic cigarettes similarly to traditional cigarettes. The money from the increased tax would be used for tobacco and vaping cessation efforts throughout the state. But that proposal doesn't sit well with vape shops or their customers. They say it punishes adults who are using the devices to quit smoking and gives people less of an incentive to make the switch. We would definitely be able to recover after um, adjusting, but I think, I think the tax is, would probably do exactly what it's meant to do as far as the Attorney General is concerned, which is to put a hit on the, in, on the industry that is e-cigarettes. Another controversial aspect of the bill, including e-cigarettes and the statewide smoking ban. Cities like Indianapolis have already banned the devices from public places in their smoke-free ordinances. If people see that it's now socially acceptable to vape in public, uh, it'll become seen as uh, a healthier, uh, not as bad as cigarettes, uh, and that they'll continue to uh, propagate the myth that these are ways of uh, helping you beat smoking. I completely disagree with that. I mean, I've, there, there's no harm from secondhand water vapor. There's no harm from smelling something that smells like, I mean, my current flavor smells like bubble gum and melons. I mean, I don't think that's going to harm anyone really. All of the proposals are aimed primarily at reducing the rate of electronic cigarette use among teenagers, which keeps increasing. The president and CEO of the Indiana Youth Institute says there was a 2% increase in teen use of the products in 2014, and he says there's evidence the products are harmful to teens. There are several reasons for this. One is how nicotine affects the development of the adolescent brain. It has very harmful effects as the teenage brain is still developing. At the same time, we're renormalizing the use of tobacco products. We've worked so hard for so many years uh, to help kids know the danger of nicotine and smoking, the e-cigarettes are kind of renormalizing the use of tobacco products. You want to change the tank out? You turn Back at Indy e-cigs in Bloomington, workers understand why there are concerns about vaping. But they say more research needs to come before more regulation. Seems excessive to me as far as, I mean, it's a cessation method, despite what, you know, some people say. It's not FDA approved, but it definitely works. I know everybody in my house has quit smoking because of it. The proposal would also require e-liquids to be sold in child-resistant packaging. A Centers for Disease Control study found that the number of calls to poison centers involving e-cigarette liquids rose from one per month in September 2010 to 215 per month, month in February of 2014. Indiana vapor shops say most e-liquid companies already use that childproof packaging. Very interesting, Barbara. Thank you very much. And now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dirkman, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly is co-sponsoring a bill that would allow businesses to hire people up to 40 hours per week without providing health benefits. The federal health care law passed in 2010 defines full time as working 30 hours a week and requires businesses provide health insurance to all full time employees. Donnelly says that has created an unintended consequence where some employers have reduced workers hours to avoid the requirement to provide health insurance. President Obama has already threatened to veto a similar bill the House passed this week. But Donnelly says if his bill passes, he hopes the White House reconsiders its position. The state budget committee is releasing $200 million from a state fund for road construction projects. The money comes from the Major Moves 2020 fund, originally named because when it was created two years ago, lawmakers envisioned keeping the money set aside until the year 2020. But the budget committee released half of the fund last year to add lanes to major interstates and earlier this week, 
Governor Mike Pence asked for the remaining money to expand additional highways. Terre Haute is still waiting on $3 million. Mayor Duke Bennett says was supposed to come by the end of 2014 as part of a business deal. The city contracted California-based company Powerdyne to take its sewer sludge and convert it to diesel fuel for 20 years. As part of that deal, Powerdyne was supposed to pay the city $3 million by December and another $3 million at the end of this year. In an interview last month, Bennett said the contract would be a boon to the city. It's going to provide us an opportunity to lower our expenses and raise some new revenues. And so it's a win across the board. Powerdyne's president says some things still need to be worked out, but he declined to elaborate. The expected $3 million is figured into the 2015 budget, and without it, Terre Haute's finances will be in the red. A law placing strict requirements on abortion clinics that provide only chemical and not surgical abortions is being axed after lawyers representing the state and Planned Parenthood of Indiana agreed to end the legal battle over the law's constitutionality. A U.S. District Court judge ruled the law unconstitutional in December, and in a statement Wednesday, Indiana's Attorney General said both sides agreed that even if the case went back to trial, the outcome would be the same. As a result, the judge ordered her ruling would be the final one in the case. The law would only have have affected one Lafayette abortion clinic. Despite changes designed to make teacher evaluations tougher, almost all of the state's public school teachers were rated as effective last school year. The percentage of teachers earning a rating of highly effective or effective rose to 89% from 87.6% the year before. The number of teachers rated as ineffective, a rating that could lead to them losing their jobs, was virtually unchanged, falling to less than half of 1%. The evaluation system was put in place after critics of the old evaluation system complained that some teachers were evaluated based on one classroom visit by a principal and sometimes not evaluated each school year. More people are moving out of Indiana than are moving into the state. That's according to a report from the Evansville-based moving company Atlas Van Lines. The report shows in 2014 about 1,400 households moved to Indiana, while more than 1,700 moved out. The margin is slightly smaller than 2013, however. In that year, about 600 more households moved out of the state than moved in. Indiana State University has generated about $350,000 in royalties from drilling oil. The money from an Illinois-based drilling company, Pioneer Oil, is expected to be used for maintenance needs. Pioneer Oil began drilling work about a year ago. ISU received a chunk of money up front and now gets royalties of at least 15%. Duke Energy is expanding its use of solar power. The company signed 20-year agreements with three solar energy companies to purchase up to 20 megawatts of solar power for Indiana customers. Duke filed a request with the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission to approve the deal, and if approved, four solar panel projects will be built. The projects in Clay, Howard, and Vigo counties are expected to provide renewable energy by the end of this year. Gas prices are back up to more than $2 per gallon, even though oil prices dropped below $50 a barrel this week. And analysts say gas stations have been operating at razor-thin margins in recent weeks in an attempt to compete with each other. So now prices are increasing as gas stations try to increase their profit margins. While the trend has been occurring nationally, it is more pronounced in Indiana, where prices last week were among the lowest in the country. The most cost-effective way to treat snow-covered roads is getting much more expensive. Casey Kuhn explains why the price of salt has shot up in Indiana. The Indiana Department of Transportation says last year's harsh winter caused a salt shortage, leading to increased prices this year. Some cities, like Greencastle, bought their salt supplies earlier than usual to make the salt more affordable. Ours was locked in at a lower rate, knowing and anticipating it would be going up. We don't know when that's going to come, but our, our barns are full right now. And INDOT says it has all the salt it needs to combat hazardous road conditions, like those experienced this week. But they had to pay 57 percent more to build up the stockpile. And counties that get their salt directly from INDOT are feeling the cost increase. This year, Brown County, for example, is paying $84 per ton of salt, compared to $65 last year. Even with the price spike, INDOT says they won't be cutting back on winter services. And Indiana is one of, a, of only a handful of states without a state fossil, but a new bill could change that. 
Two state senators have authored a bill that would name the elegant sea lily as Indiana's official state fossil. Paleontologists say the fossil plays an especially important role in Indiana's history because it was discovered in Crawfordsville. Sea lilies still exist in oceans today, but the remains found in Indiana, Joe, date from hundreds of millions of years ago. Well, I guess that makes sense with all the limestone heritage in the area. Huh? Yes. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Is it time to stop protecting river otters in Indiana? Why some people argue the animals have become a nuisance and hunters should be allowed to trap them. And the first week of the legislative session has been a busy one as lawmakers seemingly shot down some ideas as quickly as they were proposed. What's shaping up to take priority? Our State House reporter breaks it down right here on Indiana News Desk. PBS kicks off the weekend with Charlie Rose and America's top newsmakers on his new series, Charlie Rose, The Week. Some people say, well, you know, Obama was this raving liberal before, now he's you know, Dick Cheney. Recap the week's biggest stories and Charlie's best interviews. You feel there's this incredible synergy between the audience and, and the performer, and time slows down. And get a look at the week ahead. Charlie Rose, The Week. Check local listings. The fact that PBS is the most trusted media outlet in the country means a great deal to me. We live now in the most multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic America ever. There are a lot of voices in this country that need to be heard. And I think that my job is to help Americans re-examine the assumptions that they hold, to expand their inventory of ideas, and hopefully to introduce Americans to each other. And we take that challenge seriously every day. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The 2015 state legislative session began this week and already it seems like there's a lot to talk about. To fill us in on the latest, we're joined in person this week by State House reporter Brandon Smith. Brandon, thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here, Joe. Lawmakers started to outline their agendas this week. What are some of those priorities? Well, House and Senate Democrats have very similar agendas. They say the chief focus of this session should be on helping struggling working class Hoosiers. And for Democrats, that begins with raising the minimum wage. That's pretty much a non-starter with Republicans and it is unlikely to happen. Now all four legislative caucuses agree that the state should spend more money funding schools, but how that money is going to get handed out will be where they disagree. One of the most contentious debates we're likely to see in the upcoming session will be on recalculating the state's school funding formula. And where does Governor Pence have to say about school funding? Well, education is at the top of the governor's agenda. It's numbers one, two, three, four, and five on his priority list. And his proposed budget does increase overall education funding. But Democrats are concerned because the governor wants to increase funding for charter schools and the state's school voucher program, and they say that drains money from traditional public schools. And what about this proposal that would allow the governor to run for both president and governor at the same time? Well, the, this bill was filed by uh, Carmel Republican Senator Mike Delf, and it would allow any state lawmaker or the governor to run for both a state and federal office in the same election instead of having them choose between one or the other. And Delf has said that the bill was aimed at Governor Mike Pence. And how has the uh, governor responded to this? Well, he was quick to note he had absolutely nothing to do with the bill, and he called it a well-intentioned distraction. It's, it's not on our agenda, and it's not our focus. You know, I, I have to tell you, I am completely focused uh, on the future of the people of Indiana and completely focused on this session of the General Assembly. We'll let, we'll let decisions about my future await for the spring. But legislative leaders are pretty skeptical about this bill. Uh, both Speaker Brian Bosma and Senate President Pro Tem David Long uh, say that they are opposed to this idea entirely. And Long says the bill is unlikely to even get a hearing. There's another bill proposed that would make the state superintendent an appointed rather than an elected position. What's the latest on that? Well, this goes back to lawmakers have been discussing for some time about their concerns of, about the ongoing tension between the State Board of Education and Superintendent Ritz. And a lot of that stems from the fact that Ritz is a Democrat and the State Board is made up of members who are appointed by the governor, who is, of course, a Republican. Will head lawmakers support this measure? That remains to be seen a little bit. Uh, I will say that top lawmakers will almost certainly oppose any change to the office that takes effect before 2016, which is the next time that Ritz would be up for re-election. Yeah, frankly, in this situation, I think Superintendent Ritz deserves to run again uh, for another term without us trying to change the rules on 
but out beyond that, out in 2020, 2021, if she decides to run again or not, that's a different situation with a different governor and probably a different legislature. And, and I think, you know, making that change is, it will be a good thing for Indiana because I think the appointed superintendent is the proper and normal way to go about it in, in most of the states. There is one more legislative uh, measure that leaders said that they would probably support. It's redistricting. What's the latest on that bill? Well, the proposed bill would create an independent redistricting commission, which would then be responsible for drawing the lines. What remains to be seen there, though, is how that commission would be appointed, uh, who, would, uh, who would do the appointing, and, and who would ultimately be responsible for actually approving the maps, because there are some state constitutional issues involved there. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon, for being here today. Thank you, Joe. Seventy years ago, fur trappers and development eliminated river otters in Indiana. Wildlife officials reintroduced the river otter to the state in 1995. Today, they live in all but a dozen of Indiana's counties, and they're starting to become a problem. As Gretchen Frazee reports, state officials are considering what was once unthinkable, instituting an otter trapping season. John Van Horn loves the outdoors. I'm a hunter, I'm a fisherman. The centerpiece of Van Horn's backyard is a large pond. He stocks it with bluegill and catfish so he and his family can fish and enjoy the wildlife in their backyard. But recently, otters have moved in. I went down there and I chased them around the pond so I was pretty close to them, but they weren't afraid of me. And I got a good look at them and they were really neat looking, but the being neat looking and costing me money isn't uh, isn't the thing. But this right in through here is where I saw that. Van Horn could only watch as the river otters ate the fish he bought to stock his pond. The Department of Natural Resources received 86 complaints like Van Horn's in 2013, up from just 34 in 2011. That's why the DNR is now proposing letting Hoosiers trap them. Illinois, um, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, they've all reintroduced, reintroduced river otter and they all have regulated trapping seasons. And so we looked at, you know, all of their experiences and, you know, essentially going last, we were able to see the good and the bad of, you know, what had been done and come up with a really good plan after, you know, consulting with uh, biologists uh, from those other states. The proposed otter trapping season would run from November through March. For at least the first year, there would be a cap of 600 otters total and two otters per person. Trappers would have to register with the state before and after catching an otter. On a recent weekday morning, Don Coley sets traps for beaver and muskrat. At this point, I'll take the safeties off. But he soon hopes he'll be able to trap otters as well. To me, it'd just be the ideal thing to catch something that was endangered years ago and uh, has been brought back to the Indiana. If I was going to set for an otter, that's where I'd set a 220 conna bear. Coley has been trapping been since he was a young boy and right says there. it's a family tradition it's he wants to keep going. Personally, I'd just love to see it uh, more or less for my grandchildren. Coley and a group of trappers donated money in the 90s to help the DNR bring river otters back to Indiana. He says trappers have made their traps more humane in recent years, and he assures they're made so they don't unintentionally trap dogs or other pets. Others still have That's concerns. At a public hearing, Greg Griffin spoke against the proposal, saying he was worried history would repeat itself and the otter would once again disappear from Indiana. Wildlife is the public's trust. That's a public trust that we're dealing with there. To say that if we don't trap them, that they're going to, you know, the numbers are going to go off the charts. Who's to say that's true? Supporters of trapping counter that other states with trapping seasons have still seen an increase in their river otter populations. And biologists say if an otter hunting season isn't approved, the DNR will have to come up with something to keep the otter population from getting out of hand. Just like with a lot of other species, you know, whether it's white-tailed deer, the Canada geese that you see behind me, anytime those populations get higher, sometimes there's a little bit of an erosion of uh, public support for those species. And so that's our responsibility to, to manage those species. The State Natural Resources Commission is currently reviewing the proposal and could decide whether to approve it as early as January 20th. And for the past 75 years, many Hoosiers thought the first Indiana basketball game was played at a YMCA in the small town of Crawfordsville in 1894. 
A historian at the Indiana State Library's digital newspaper program says he's discovered that's not true. Chandler Lighty has found documentation of basketball games played before 1894, including one in Indianapolis in 1893, one in Evansville in 1892, and a handful of others in Columbus and Bloomington, where the sport was incorporated into students' physical education classes. But Lighty says many Hoosiers still think basketball originated in the state's rural areas. And what I found kind of turns that on its head because it seems that basketball is really showing up in urban areas first. And that's, that's maybe a counter narrative to what a lot of Hoosiers and their identity, what they, what they want to believe about Hoosiers. Lighty is from Crawfordsville, so he says it's a little disappointing to know that the state's first basketball game wasn't there, but he'd rather Hoosiers know the true history of the sport. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members. Thank you.